Hello, and welcome to Follow Your Curiosity, where we explore the ups and downs of the creative process and how to keep it moving. I'm your host, Nancy Norbeck. I am a writer, singer, improv comedy newbie, science fiction geek, and creativity coach who loves helping right-brained folks get unstuck. I am so excited to be coming to you with interviews and coaching calls to show you the depth and breadth both of creative pursuits and creative people, to give you some insight into their experiences, and to inspire you. Today's guest is Dominic Shortino. Dom's been a friend of mine for a very long time, and if you looked at his day job, you might wonder why I wanted to interview him. He's a barber. In fact, I know him because his dad cut my hair when I was growing up in York, Pennsylvania, where he still lives. It's not the sort of job that comes to mind when most people hear the word creative, though it should, but Dom defies traditional boundaries where jobs and art are concerned. When I first knew him, we were all sure Dom was going to become some sort of graphic artist. He was always drawing and wanted to go to art school. His path turned out to be less straightforward. You'll hear more about that in a minute but it's also been much richer and more interesting than anyone could have guessed. Dom is a member of several local bands in York, including the Brass Monkeys, a Beastie Boys tribute band. Over the past few years, he's also started performing on his own and even writing his own songs. As you're about to hear, he's a great advocate for the arts for everyone. One of the first things that I remember about you before I even really knew you at all was being in the shop and seeing your cartoons hanging on the wall. And I remember, I'm guessing I had to have been in middle school because I think you were, must've been figuring out where you wanted to go for school. Cause I remember your dad saying to my mom, he wants to go to art school, but I told him he has to learn cut hair so that he can always make a living. And, and I remember, you know, so I'm what, like 13, maybe sitting there going, Oh, that, that's so sad. Let him go to art school. Because <laughs> I just thought, but then that's what he's going to end up doing forever, and he's never going to get to do the other stuff that he loves. And now, in retrospect, I would argue with my 13-year-old self that there's plenty of creativity in cutting hair, but I wasn't really right. seeing that at the absolutely. time. But I'm just wondering, first of all, am I remembering this right? You, and- you have it absolutely 100% <laughs> correct. And after I became a barber, then it, he said, uh, you know, it only takes six more months to learn women's hair, women's hair. So I did that. And then he said, okay, now you can go to art school. And what you probably don't know is that I did sit, spend a semester in art school and I absolutely hated it. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> so um, I remember the, the professor saying, okay, you're going to draw a perfume bottle and you are going to draw this perfume bottle so that people want to buy it. And I was like, I don't want to draw a perfume bottle. I want to draw a dragon. So I drew a perfume bottle with a dragon on it, which I don't know what kind of women want that, but <laughs> probably I'm, plenty. So, yeah, you know, nerdy women, right? <laughs> no, no disrespect there, but uh, bad props to the nerdy women. And uh, but it just didn't stick. So uh, I just said, you know, I'm already making money at cutting hair, and I really enjoy it. And um, that's what I did. But what did come in handy is. <clears throat> um, probably about five years into cutting hair now, maybe a little more like seven, uh, I went to school for Clairol and learned how to color hair. And that's when the art and the uh, commerce of cutting hair really blended well. And I, oh, cool. I educated for Clairol for two years, for just a day, one day a week. And I really learned about mixing colors and colors are colors, whether you're doing hair or mm-hmm. painting a house or painting a canvas. And uh, so, yeah, at the time... I was like, well, I'll just get through this so that uh, I can go to art school then. And then I found out that uh, the regimented, the regimenting of my art was really not for me. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. So it, it's a win-win because I have a business that I love, but I also get to make art without boundaries. I can do whatever I want to do. I don't have this degree dictating, you know, yeah. uh, nothing wrong with the degree, obviously, you know, it, it's, it wasn't for me. You know, I was meant to do a different path, and I'm I'm very happy with where I ended up. That's cool. How did you feel about it at the time when your dad was like, "Nope, you got to do this thing first? Um, I understood completely because it's an Italian family, <laughs> and it's just it's all about the business. And there was no resentment there at all. I was just happy that he was going to not only that he said I could go to school, but that he would he would pay for it. So I saw it mean so now. I'm like, of course I'll do this. It's only a year and a half, and then I'll get to go to four years of art school. And uh, it didn't work out that way. So he was right in a weird way. But I could see a lot of, you know, uh, children being resentful. Oh, how dare you tell me, you know, 
but it was mm-hmm. a different kind of home. You know, it was an, an Italian American household. Is you have to have um, you have to have this trade that you can make money because. And it wasn't that he didn't believe in my art at all. Um, he was just being pragmatic, which, right? <laughs> which my father was. No, he totally understood art because he was an artist himself. That's right. So, um, yeah, uh, it all worked out. So I, there was no resentment for that. Uh, I completely understood it, and it's uh, it's it's definitely kind of. I have three boys, and I have one in college now. And I've passed that down because I'm just adamant that they get a trader degree and then they do whatever they want. And uh, I don't care what the degree's in. <laughs> just mm-hmm. that they, I think education is vitally important. And, you know, since I didn't have it uh, by choice, I can see some of the things I missed, some mm-hmm. uh, educational opportunities, not the social opportunities, but uh, that I've, I, you know, I've gone back and read classics and you know, stuff that people had to do. And I thought, you know, I should do this now. <laughs> but no, no resentment at all. But I'm kind of, as you know, a Zen person anyway, so. Yeah. <laughs> it all it all gets woven into the fabric, so. And, and you're also, like, one of the most amazingly self-educated people I've ever met. In fact, oh, probably the wow. most. I mean, you, you read Thank more you. than, and more widely, I think, than pretty much anybody I know. Thank you very much. Um, so. It's, it's that quest for knowledge, man. That's what I love. <laughs> yeah. That keeps me going every day. There, there is something about the love of learning for the sake of learning that yes. is more powerful than and you as know. you get older it's more important that you learn to learn rather than I need to learn this so that I can no, right it's just the joy you get out of learning you don't always have that at 20 which is probably why I didn't enjoy art school <laughs> <laughs> you will do this and you will do it my way how much do you think your dad's art influenced your own um Boy, that's a really good question. What I take from my dad's art, uh, which he was prolific. He did paintings and then he did wood carvings. And I actually took a wood carving class with him maybe uh, about 15, 20 years ago. And I didn't enjoy wood carving. So I knew um, that what he he was doing was not for me. You know, the, uh, when he passed away and he had all these wood carving tools, all his wood carver friends, are you gonna are you gonna do this now? And no, I hated wood carving. I really <laughs> despised it. And uh, so, uh, but what I take away from it, I love this, is that uh, I don't think there's this conception like me going to school that in order to make art, it has to be a certain standard of good, and. It's, that's not true at all. Not that my father's art wasn't good, but it's just that you create. That's what's important. And what a lot of people don't know is the way my father got started in art was he bought my mother, his wife, um, in the first couple of years of their marriage, a paint by number set because this was huge back in the early 60s. And it was a street <laughs> scene in Italy and it sat there untouched. And one day he decided, I'm going to do this. And he did that. And that's when he started painting. And some of his uh, first paintings were incredibly <laughs> rudimentary, <laughs> but they were his, they were beautiful. Right. And I think that's how it inspired me, not so much as the style, because he's, he did a lot of Bob Ross stuff in the 70s. And so it's kind of kitschy. And I love it because I love that kind of kitsch. Uh, but it wouldn't be classified as high art, but it was, it was implicitly him. Mm-hmm. It's who he was. So I think what I take away from that is um, it's not important that you try to emulate your heroes or anybody that you think is great. It's it's more important that you get to the paper or the canvas or the instrument what's you. That's what art is. And and that actually brings me to to your quote from Facebook. Oh, from, wow. Okay. Let's see. How long ago was this? September of 2016. So a little while ago. And you said, every single person on this planet should play an instrument or sing or draw or sculpt or paint. And if they're not good at it, they still should. Art's what's going to save us. Oh, nice. Thank you for remembering that. (laughs) So I only have, how much time do I have to talk about that? Because this could be the rest of the interview. Well, start. (laughs) And I do have a couple other questions. We'll see see where we go. Um, We are all constantly creating obviously and it's just something you do if you make a pot of coffee when you wake up you're creating if you cook dinner you're creating um and we can also create messes of our lives and 
when messes get created, man, I'm, is it okay to get deep here? This is yeah, deep. So absolutely. when messes get created, what happens is you have, you know, people in opposition with each other. And obviously we know this is the human condition and that's why we need, um, the military. That's why we need police forces. That's why we need politics. That's why we need uh, structures and institutions. But the truth is, uh, creativity is nothing like that. Creativity is uh, expressing who you are, but at the same time, first of all, creating is always an homage. You are emulating something. Somebody has influenced you. So, you never have to worry about copying because everything to a degree is a copy, even if it's only a 1% copy. And that's the beautiful thing about creating. And that's why we should all create is because you are not only borrowing from somebody, you're making something beautiful, even if it's only beautiful to you and you are adding beauty to the world. So it unites us or can divide, <laughs> but it unites it is, is that there's, there's, a passion there that is unparalleled in anything else. You know, you can't drive a car with that kind of passion unless you're Mario Andretti or something. But um, it, it's a passion that comes out of you that you're paying tribute to somebody, but you're also expressing yourself. And it, it's good to get a lot of garbage out of you. <laughs> Art as a form of protest is a beautiful thing. And the wonderful thing about that is nobody gets hurt. It's not violent. That's true. And that's why I think even as simple, I think one of the easiest things anybody can do um, as far as creating is, is keeping a journal because it feels so good to get that out and be honest. And then you can even say things maybe you wouldn't say out loud. And now you've gotten it out and you haven't hurt anybody. You've reflected upon it. And... Uh, does that make sense? I guess I'm, yeah. I'm rambling on and on here, but what I'm saying is um, that transcends institutions that transcends uh, politics that transcends religion. It's something, and that's why it will save us. And that's why um, all the religions, the essence of religions is not in the dogma or the creeds because those have been made by institutions, but the essence of all great religions is art. I mean, the Hebrew scriptures are, it's all poetry. It's all beautiful poetry. Um, the Quran is poetry. Uh, anything Buddhist is poetry, but then you have these great Gothic art pieces of Christ and uh, the great uh, medieval art of, of God. And to me, that's creating and people can see that beauty and come together. And that's why I think beautiful save is because institutions can't do it and uh, military might violence can't do it, but ourselves together expressing ourselves in a beautiful way is definitely is going to, is what's going to save us. By the way, Brian Zond wrote a book called beauty will save the world. And Ooh. that's where I get that quote. He is a Christian preacher, but he's not um, your run of the mill Christian preacher. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to scare anybody off <laughs> by that. But if you get a chance, anybody to read beautiful will save the world. That's where that quote comes from. And that's uh, a creed of mine. Cool. I had no idea that there, there were other people. I mean, there are people who are saying the same thing, but I didn't realize that anybody had gone so far as to you know, write a book, write a book about, it. about it. So I'm definitely going to check that out. Sure. So in the course of managing to do your art, despite art school not being for you and despite ending up cutting hair rather than drawing comics um, <laughs> and and obviously in some ways because you're mixing colors and you're, you're sure. doing the things you do you cause it's, it's so funny because I had originally really thought of you as visual art because that's what I remember oh, right. from so long ago sure. but then you started doing music how was was music always there or did that come along later or it's so interesting because I primarily do music now I, I, I do a lot of cartooning but it's mostly of members of my family <laughs> so it's, they must it's love that. oh yeah absolutely <laughs> so um, my my art is, is is definitely pigeonholed to a very narrow <laughs> Uh, population of four, my wife and three kids, <laughs> because they're the only ones that'll get it. And maybe an mm -hmm. aunt or uncle here, but uh, it's not that I don't want to draw or, or paint or whatever. I probably will at some point again. It's just not now because I'm so busy with other things, but it's funny. There's a funny story about that too, is that I started playing guitar when I was seven 
and I'm sure that I drew before that, but um, so I started guitar very young, and uh, then I took piano my senior year. I always wanted to learn drums, but my father wouldn't let me. Now that I was angry about. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want the noise. So I would put on my Walkman, the orange headphones and the cassette Walkman, and I would take two pencils and sit at my desk. I would watch the drummers in jazz band play drums and I would learn off them. There's no internet at this time, so I couldn't search. So I would learn techniques, I would ask them questions, then I would sit at my desk and learn how to play drums. So um, music has always been there, just as strong as art. But it's so funny because my senior year, uh, when we went and ordered our class rings, <laughs> and you know, you, you put on the side what you wanted to do. So I had my, you know, I had the York Suburban Trojans on one side and the other side was supposed to be art. And it was a palette with a brush. And for some reason at the last minute, I said, you know, I do more music than anything. I'm going to change this to music. And I changed the little, so it has a little guitar on it now mm -hmm. and everything. And um, I think at that point in my life, I was conscious that music was, was going to pay, play a bigger role than, um, you know, painting or, or drawing. So, yeah, it's definitely been there for, yeah, since I was seven, I played guitar. And I think first time I tried to form a band, I was like 15. And that was great. I remember we played Michael Cimbello's Maniac from the Flashdance soundtrack. I learned that solo note for note. <laughs> I was proud of that. <laughs> That's so amazing, though, that, you know, yeah. learning to play the drums with two pencils is is just wild. It, I, you know, it's probably my proudest achievement because I did it all. I've never had a formal lesson. And then when Rock Band for Xbox came out a couple years ago, you remember those drum pads? Like, I was so excited to get it for my kids because I'm like, I'm going to really learn how to play drums now, <laughs> which they were, don't really teach you. But there is rhythm involved. Mm -hmm. But now I actually had a kick pedal and um, some drums. So I had pads. So now I would put on the iPod instead of the Walkman and I would bang out beats. And um, the reason I'm so proud for it of it is because I guess about 10 years ago, two friends of mine who already had a band said they needed a drummer and they called me because they heard I was a drummer. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they're going to find out <laughs> I'm not a drummer. And uh, I went down and played with them and I'm still their drummer. And we've played some pretty incredible gigs where we actually, um, we play many styles of music or many artists. We don't write any songs. We're mostly a cover band, but we're also a tribute to Weezer. So uh, I've played Weezer songs on the drums and I've never had a lesson. <laughs> and I'm pretty proud of that. I, See, it's, I'm able enough to take it out and actually get compensated for it. And, and you're proving my point about how much stuff you learn on your own. I mean, that's incredible. Absolutely. It's, you know, who said that? That I think it was Teddy Roosevelt said that success is uh, 99. What is it? Is that the Edison quote? <laughs> There's a Thomas Edison. Yeah. 99% pers perspiration. 1% perspiration, inspiration. 99% yeah. perspiration. Yeah. I think. Well, there again, don't, just try to be yourself. You know, it's, and I'm not saying you can just get up there and clang on cymbals and decide <laughs> I'm not using a snare today. No, there's obviously if you're playing something structured, but you can do it, especially now with the resources available. My gosh, you know, but yes, I, you put your mind to it. And I think we, we get, we get hung up on, um, approval. Mm -hmm. So that prevents us from making art, but, Boy, if that was the case, I would have never taken the stage with a set of drums if I was looking for approval. You know, I did it yeah. because it was. And then, you you know, as you get more confidence, you become more successful. Yeah. When, you, when you're when you willing and with with painting or writing, when you're willing to bear your soul, just taking that stuff, you're going to get accolades for that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> it's true. Even if it's poor grammar, <laughs> you know, people are going to be like, wow, you, you bared your soul. That's pretty awesome. Right. So now how many bands have you been in because i didn't know about that one. Oh, okay. i knew about um, god bless my mobile home like that like the, the, like <laughs> like currently or just overall i'll start with overall <laughs> overall not many actually uh one two three four five or six um currently i guess technically three but only two are active so okay. and even that i don't play more than once or twice a month um but the first band was a bunch of high school kids there's actually a couple little more projects somewhere along there. But God Bless Our Mobile Home, which um, is kind of like hillbilly rock, uh, that's been going on for over 20 years. 
And the bass player and I are married to sisters, so that's easy to keep going. We're always <laughs> together. And um, and then the Weezer tribute, we're just three middle-aged guys making rock and roll. So that's more just fun. Uh, we're not. It's not that we're not serious about it, but there's. it's very relaxing. What's that one called? It, we're, we call ourselves the Delfs. <laughs> <laughs> but actually... Uh, what we go by is Death to False Metal usually uh, because Death to False Metal is the name of a Weezer album. It's the Weezer B-Sides album. So when we bill ourselves as that, people that are Weezer fans know they're getting Weezer music. And then Brass Monkeys, which is the Beastie Boys tribute. And that's more like a business, which uh, it's run like a business. It's very regimented and a lot of practice involved. Not that we're not creating. Again, it's mm -hmm. an homage. Right. And actually what's more important there is... Um, I think even if you're playing cover songs or you're in a tribute band, um, you have great fun because you're performing music that you love, but it's how does that inspire you? I mean, that has inspired me to do a lot more with my music. The fact that I could take a stage and actually have a business kind of aspect um, to music has affected everything in my life as far as uh, making music. And is that the one you spend the most time with? Yes, that not as much practice because it's a limited catalog of music. Mm -hmm. So we know it all already. That was the first year or two really hammering it out. But um, but we, we usually play every month. And uh, yeah, that's that's more time consuming because there's a lot of travel involved. And. Uh, but at the same time, the four of us also find time either during sound check or at other opportunities to play together in a looser environment where we are creating. It's not just playing Beastie Boys songs. Mm -hmm. For instance, I think uh, next Monday there, um, there were two firefighters that died in New York uh, when a building collapsed, the first firefighters we've lost in almost 50 years and they're having a benefit for them here in New York. And we are the backing band. So oh, we cool. get to yeah play behind all these great horn musicians. So you know, all these things, as long as you're creating music, man, it leads to all kinds of opportunities, especially in a smaller community like York, PA, which is, you know, all the musicians seem to know each other. Well, and how far afield do you go with Brass Monkeys? Because I know you were up in Brooklyn a while back. Um, we, we were in Brooklyn twice. We've been all over Pennsylvania. Um, we're going to Syracuse, I think. And we, back in February, we went to Germany and spent five days there. And that was incredible. How was that? That was amazing. I, I'm so blasted. I never have gotten, I, it's the first time I ever went to Europe. And um, it's, it's uh, music, man, the universal language. Yeah, are the audiences <laughs> different in Germany? Um, everybody there was so nice. I think what's different in Europe is they just appreciate live music a lot more with no disrespect to any American music fans. Uh, it's, it's so much more ingrained in their culture um, that they're willing to pay musicians that they give musicians and not that it's about us, but they, they give the musicians attention, you know, that they actually come to see you perform as opposed to just, Oh, I want somebody in the background making music while mm -hmm. I eat. You know, um, a prime example is Tim Warfield. I don't know if you ever heard of Tim Warfield. He's, uh, he lives right, he lives not far from here and he's won Grammys. He's won jazz Grammys. He's a graduate of York High, amazing saxophonist. And, uh, you know, he plays here in York at the Holy Hound once a month, which is, you know, just a bar and, and, and people love seeing him, but he's gone to Europe and filled halls mm -hmm. because he's a Grammy nominated jazz yeah. musician and they just, I think just think they have uh, a different view of that, you know, than, than we do here. Uh, the one, the one great thing about uh, playing Germany is that there were all these people screaming the lyrics while we were seeing them, except they didn't really speak English. So they just kind of ma 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 along with what we were singing. So they knew the songs, but not the words. And that was just fantastic. <laughs> it was, yeah. But you know, that's not keeping them from, from oh, along they had yeah. Fun. It was it was it was really probably the best show we played, just as far as uh, connection with the audience. <laughs> so, you also then started performing on your own. Yes, that was a huge leap for me, because I had never performed solo. 
And I kind of remember your Facebook post that sounded, I mean, as much as a Facebook post can right. sound kind of apprehensive, like, okay, I'm going, I'm doing this thing. I'm kind of scared. Yeah, Tell I was, me what you want me to I play. I was absolutely <laughs> terrified. And which is funny for such a Zen person, but here's the bottom line is um, I have to, I have to, you know, if I'm trying to sell you this idea that just go out and be fearless and create, um, I have to do it. I have to put my money where my mouth is. So I, I don't know. I just had this feeling that I had to do it. And I even told a guy who wanted to book me. I'm like, I don't, I don't do this. He's like, you'll do fine. <laughs> and you know what? Here's, here's the thing. In the end, everything works out. It always does. But there's very few people that are going to bear their soul and get booed. <laughs> It, it doesn't happen um, unless you're making something really horrible, like hateful or you're screaming obscenities in the audience. Um, if you bear your soul, there's going to be people that support you. It just speaks to the essence. So, uh, yeah, I didn't even know what I was going to do. I, so I mapped out all these songs and I'm like, I can't do these songs because this song is like a singer songwriter song. And this song's like more hard rock. It's all over the map, but then you think, well, that's who I am. That's what I listen to. And as long as it's authentic, and I think I've done, oh my gosh, a dozen since then. And I, I love it more and more. I just did one two weeks ago and it was probably the most fun I've ever had. So, uh, I'll tell you what really got me over the hump with that. And, uh, I don't know if you know about this. I started doing these Friday night Facebook live requests. No, uh, I didn't know. Oh, yeah. This is this has been so much fun. So I pour myself an adult beverage or two or three or whatever. <laughs> I, I'd like to get the, the shakes out. And I pick up my electric guitar and then I live stream it. And I ask the audience, the viewing audience, to request a song. And I have no idea what that song's going to be. And I might not even know how to play it, but that's the power of the internet. I just pull up the chords and I say, here we go. And it's incredibly embarrassing. <laughs> and... <laughs> Because some of it sounds horrendous. I think one night somebody requested uh, Paradise by the Dashboard Light by oh Meatloaf, which I, I don't like that song. I don't like <laughs> Meatloaf. And, uh, but hey, I, that's the rules. If I know the song, I have to play it. And that's been really cathartic for me in getting over stage fright, which is always present. It's always present. But that's a good thing. Stage fright is good because it's that adrenaline, man. You know, it, that's what spurs you into creating. So yeah, the, the Friday night live request has been a lot of fun. So now I've taken that into two bars and clubs and I, I do a three hour set with breaks. And then the last hour is request a song. This is not just going to be played over the internet, but to these people right. in the bar. And that's been a blast. So, and they yeah. go for it. Even if you don't know the song well and whatever. Yeah. Last, uh, the last two weeks ago, I butchered, absolutely butchered. Um, <laughs> I think Black Hole Sun by Soundgarden. And there was one more. Oh, the first request was Sweet Home Alabama. <laughs> really did not want to play that one, but I did. <laughs> and how, I mean, what's the response like in person if, if it's something that you've butchered? Uh, everybody, you did know, you that's what's... warn them? I, I tell them, you know, like, if I've never played it, I tell them I've never played this song. And so that those, there's maybe a modicum of understanding from the audience. <laughs> but uh, so I think what... It's it's funny because everybody's so in on the act that if you fail, they're you know you're failing with them. You know, they, <laughs> they're almost as guilty. Like, oh, we shouldn't have requested this, <laughs> <laughs> and everybody just laughs and claps. But <laughs> so then it's not your fault. Yeah, I think everybody, man, we're all taking dares when we create art. I think you know, you go big or go home, man. Take that dare. If if you're being told inside to do it, just do it, even if you fail. Again, you're not failing, but I mean, if you fail to yourself, you'd be surprised yeah. how it inspires people. Yeah. yeah. I think the only failure is not to even try. Exactly. There you go. Nancy Norbeck quote, or <laughs> <laughs> did you borrow that? I don't know. I probably read that idea so many places <laughs> yeah. that I couldn't really no, claim you're, it. But you're absolutely yeah. right. No doubt. Yeah. So what about writing your own music? Um, yes, I have. I haven't for quite some time, but... Um, It was easy with God Bless Our Mobile Home because most of the songs are about drinking or cars or women <laughs> because we're kind of a tongue-in-cheek country rock, I don't know what. Um, the most frustrating 
thing to me about writing music is that there's a limited number of chords and there's a limited number of chords that sound good together. Now you can be extremely daring like we talked about and put a B flat next to a A, but you better know what you're doing, whatever, <laughs> in some kind of ascending or descending way. But, um, so you always get this stuck in your head that, oh, this has been done before. This progression is, well, of course it has. <laughs> Every single song has already been written <laughs> in some way, shape or form. The notes are in a different order. So that that's my biggest hurdle is just trying to be myself and, and uh, write um, and not worry about what it sounds like. And uh, yeah, because I remember writing a song once and thinking, oh, this is pretty good. And then listening to my iPod one day and I think, oh, wait, I just rewrote that song because <laughs> I listen to so much music that it gets ingrained in your head. Um, but that doesn't matter. I still wrote it and I'm not going to play it out maybe mm -hmm. and not record it, but I still made something and it's part of that journey. And uh, studying song structure is fascinating to me. And I was always scared to do it because... I didn't want to willingly rip off another song, mm -hmm. but I was wrong. I mean, just studying it and you think, oh, they went from there to there. That's really interesting. And then you use that in a different way. So everything is borrowed, but songwriting is definitely the hardest aspect to my art. For me, um, I can I can play till the sun sets. I can sing till the sun sets. But to write a song, I have to, I have to force myself to do that. <laughs> Fair enough. I'd so rather jam. <laughs> that sounds like fun right so how do you balance everything that you do um it's easier now that my children are older um but i i don't really because what if, if it sounds fun i do it and it doesn't matter if i have the time or not i'll move something to make the time so Sometimes I look at my calendar and just think, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And I have to push that aside because I know once I do it, I'll have fun. Um, just this week, you know, I'm doing this and then I'm, I'm actually going to record Wednesday night, I'm going to play guitar tomorrow night for a youth church service practice. So every night, but what would I be doing? I would be binging something that's probably not even worth binging on Netflix, you know? <laughs> It's not like work where they say, oh, if you spend too much time on this, it's going to take away from this. The, the thing with creating is it's, it's fun. It's who you are. So, you know, if you work all day, but then come home and create from 5 to 11.30 p.m., you're not wiped out because of it. You're, in, you're in, invigorated. Now, if you hang yourself up on the thought that, oh, my gosh, I just did this for six and a half hours, you can't because you would be doing something else. If it's relaxing, it's the same as reading a book or taking a walk, it's, you know, it's really igniting you. So I just make sure that, uh, my relationships don't suffer with my children mm -hmm. or my wife, which is not difficult because like I said, this, the, the kids are grown. My wife and I are 26 years in, we have <laughs> pretty understanding with each other. So I kind of just do it. And, um, yeah, when we played Brooklyn with brass monkeys, it was interesting because uh, that was a huge opportunity for us because, it was MCA day, which is the day that honors Adam Yauch, who was one of the members of the BC board is actually the one I portray. So we would be performing for his friends and family. So I really couldn't pass this up. And, uh, it turns out it was in the same day that I was moving my son in college Ooh. five hours away. And I immediately made the decision. I can't do this because I have to move my son into college. But, um, my family was incredibly supportive. That's, that's really important. Mm -hmm. And they said, you, you have to do this. So I drove by my son into college at 530 in the morning. And then at noon, I drove Whoa. to Brooklyn and performed at 530. And, uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's what it's all about. <laughs> like that's, yeah. So you talk about how you juggle. It's you make time for what's important to you. And you obviously don't regret doing all I that. I do not regret doing any of that. <laughs> it not only did it open so many doors for us, uh, as a business, but, um, it, it introduced me to so many incredible artists from different communities, uh, that I've become friends with now. And, you know, they come to my shows and one of them, um, is actually an artist that does, uh, almost exclusively portraits of, 
um, hip hop artists. And they're amazing. They're lifelike portraits. And he lives right in uh, Annapolis. He's like an hour away from me. Wow. Yeah. Are they going to do some for you guys? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> if we asked him, I bet he would. I wouldn't ask him to do that. <laughs> he has to create what he wants to create. You know? Oh, that's true. I'm, I'm sure we could commission him for a piece. But I do have one of his pieces. And uh, But yeah, so just, uh, you know, I thought I was doing it for the opportunities for the band and stuff. But it was so much more than that. I mean, I meant... Uh, a photographer uh, who we formed a connection with um, and then this artist and with social media now it's so easy to keep connected with these people and uh, but yeah to your original question about um, juggling all that if it's fun just do it <laughs> it's part of your life as long as uh, you can support yourself then the rest should be what you want to do or what what makes you come alive absolutely and that's a good way to put it yeah and, and I think, too, that there, you know, it's so easy to think of the reasons why you can't do something, mm -hmm. you know, that it's, but I was going to do this this weekend, or, you know, then I'm not going to get any sleep that night or whatever, which I will admit is a big one for me. Um, but, but then when you actually do say, wait a minute, when am I going to get a chance to do this again? Absolutely. And, it, you know, something may come out of it that I can't even predict, and it's worth going just to see what happens, see what I can do, see who I meet, have the experience of, of doing it. I think that a lot of people tend to forget about all of that part when they're looking at a calendar and saying, but Absolutely. I have to do this and I have to do that. And so I've had to take off so much work to do this band, and that's always scary from a business standpoint. Um, but uh, you know, I'm, I can't do this until I die that, you know, that, that part of the band, mm -hmm. because at some point when you are paying tribute to somebody, that tribute doesn't seem authentic. If you're 20, 30 years old, and, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you know, if you want to see a Michael Jackson <laughs> tribute, you're not going to see a guy that's 80. Doing, yeah. God bless him if he can. But right. so, um, so I know I have to do this now. So if I have to miss work, I miss work, but, yeah, it's interesting you say about sleep, because work you can get back, or uh, but sleep's not something you get back. That's no. you know you can't make it up. You can't say I'll only sleep four hours tonight, so I'll sleep thirteen hours tomorrow. You still <laughs> you still have not made it up. Right. And so that is that is a dangerous gamble, absolutely for for health reasons. Yeah. You know? So that's the one. Yeah, I, I am that guy that would be in bed every night at ten just watching TV. I have to be pushed. Too. So we're, we're recording some music Wednesday night with God Bless Your Mobile Home, um, and it's a great opportunity for us. And my first thought was, oh, my gosh, it's in Mechanicsburg, and I'm not going to be home till after 10 <laughs> on a weeknight. And then I just kind of have to slap myself and say, come on, man. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm certainly not saying that, you know, everybody should stay up until 3 a.m. No, every no, night no, no. and that sleep's not you're, important because yeah. it definitely is. If you, if you think you want to do it, then you need to do it. Yeah. Even if there's that, oh, I shouldn't, but, well, there's that, but you need to do it. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. So what do you think is the most creative thing you've ever done? Mm. Or that you do now? Wow. Um, well, make music, of course, is definitely, even though I'm not writing, when there's something being in a room with a couple other musicians um, that's it's unparalleled for me when that sound comes together that's amazing that's really incredible and it's just as satisfying you've heard this said and it's just as satisfying if there's a thousand people there or two people just something about that connection mm -hmm. um, but as far as the most creative thing I've ever done hmm that's a really good question um, I think one of the things I'm proudest of is my father's eulogy. Ooh. And that kind of opened a gateway to public speaking for me that I was never really comfortable with. And I've done more public speaking now than ever. And uh, so that's been really interesting to me. And I think probably that might be what I'm proudest of is to, to summarize somebody's life in, yeah. in 10 minutes. Um, that was such a nuanced character. <laughs> So sure. yeah, I mean, even through all the art and drawing and music, I think that's that might be my my proudest moment. And I did it for my grandmother too, who died at 104. 
Good for her. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> um, but I just have more opportunities to do that. It's been amazing. There's a, there's a little, there's an event here in York uh, called York Crafted, Crafted. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Pekka Kuka format where you, okay, mm -mm. so um, <laughs> it's 20 slides, 20 seconds per slide, and you have to give a talk. So wow. um, actually, I think architects started this format and now it's known globally. The format is because apparently, and you can ask any architect, architects you might know. Gee, whatever that might be. <laughs> um, that architects tend to talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody decided this, so they said, we're only going to let you have 20 sides and we're only going to let you have 20 seconds per slide. And somebody recognized this as this is a great way to present anything because it's only two minutes and 40 seconds. Mm -hmm. And let's make this. And so I was to go talk about barbering for two minutes and 20 seconds or two minutes, 40 seconds, whatever it comes out to with 20 slides. And that was a blast for me. And then five or six other people that night get up and do the same thing. Now you rehearse it. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. you put it together yourself and right. rehearse it. Um, but yeah, the speaking has been a lot of fun for me. To, I like to be organized. So having a beginning, middle, and an end is very uh, satisfying to me. <laughs> Music doesn't always give you that. <laughs> so uh, because if it's an open jam or something, but this is like, okay, this is the way it's going to go. I like that. That's cool. I had no yeah. idea that you did the public speaking at all. So. There you go. I'm it's telling you, every time I thing. talk to you, I learn new stuff. <laughs> to you. It's like, how many of you are there? Because there's got to be like three dominants running around. I actually, you know? and I'm super proud of this. I've actually been asked to give a sermon on June 10th at a church. So um, they sent me the passage and everything. I'm like, yeah, I'm down. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited for that. You are just such a renaissance man. Amazing. <laughs> we, well, I think Amazing. I think the actually correct term is jack of all trades master. <laughs> of none. Renaissance it, renaissance man sounds nicer, but <laughs> well, you know, whichever you're, just, you're doing so many things. It's well, I think you just have cool. to you have to get it out, right? I mean, you create. You have to. It's in there. You have to get it out. If you don't get it out, you're unsatisfied. You're restless and. Yeah, there's... Find your outlet, man. I don't know if you know who Brene Brown is. She did the TED Talk six mm. or seven years ago. That yes, yes. Went viral. And, and she's got a great quote about how unused creativity is not benign. And it, I, I'm, oh, I'm butchering yeah. this, but the basic idea is, you know, it metastasizes and it turns into resentment and anger and all of these oh, things. Oh, wow. That, Interesting. You know, which is basically what you've been saying. Absolutely. And I think she's totally right. I've if you're never sitting on been this stuff unhappy. and yep. you don't let it out and you feel like you can't let it out, you know, no good comes of that. Absolutely. I agree with that 110%. If I had not been, there was not a long stretch where I wasn't in a band. <laughs> but when that happened, I was not a happy person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's, which speaks to purpose. Yeah, you know, and I think it's all in us. We all have a part in it. Yeah. Definitely. So, how has travel or geography or sense of place, whatever that might look like for you, influenced all the things that you do? Um, there's, there's so many places I haven't been. And uh, one of them is the Midwest and the West. I've always wanted to go to Wyoming and Montana and South Dakota, and I haven't. And I always wonder if that's why I'm drawn to that type of music, like the plains, like if you think of a spaghetti western, mm -hmm. like that kind of music, surf rock, um, and there's bands like the old 97s, and uh, the Reverend Horton Heat are from Texas, and uh, uh, the uh, refreshments who are out like the Las Vegas area, that have this kind of rustic desert sound to them and I've always wondered if I'm so drawn to that that type of music and I play that type of music with God Bless Mo Home because it's such a mystery to me I've never been there and I'm so intrigued by that um, but as far as travel goes I haven't got gotten to travel much at all before uh, I started playing band in bands seriously it was basically I was either here in New York or at a beach trailer that my family has in Delaware so uh, this past the past three years i've probably traveled more than i've ever traveled and it, it's definitely inspiring 
and it shows you uh, just that art is the great connector. You know, you go somewhere else, you got different currency, you have different food, you have different politics, mm -hmm. you have different means of transportation, different sides of the road you drive on. Yeah. But, you know, when I was just in Hamburg, um, we went out of our hotel and went to the coffee shop right on the corner and right across the street on the wall is a huge mural of Dr. Dre, <laughs> like in Hamburg. Like the last thing I expected to see in Hamburg. You know, you just picture all the, like there'd be a big St. Pauli girl with a pretzel. Or, you, know, you know, these preconceived notions. So when you walk out of this coffee shop, you see Dr. Dre, you're like, oh, wow. And uh, that's why, uh, yeah, I think that expands all boundaries and that's why art is so beautiful like that. That the Sistine Chapel is known around the world, that Dr. Dre is known in Hamburg, <laughs> that Elvis Presley is known in China, you know. Um, good good stuff <laughs> and again it's universal even though it's um, you don't have to be accomplished I mean if anybody asks you oh, who's the greatest guitarist of all time they're not going to say Scotty Moore who's Elvis's guitarist if they if anybody asks you that uh, you know who's the greatest singer of all time they're not going to say Dr. Dre <laughs> it, it's just a unique art form that is so honest that it it speaks to a common place around the globe. So I, I guess that has to do with travel. Yeah. I'm terrified of flying, by the way. Like, absolute paralyzing fear. So um, that's part of it. That was a huge step for me to get. Humongous. You could ask my bandmates and my family. I was borderline. <laughs> do you feel better about it now? Absolutely. I can't wait to do it again. <laughs> you know, might have needed a little help to get there, but like, what? That it's I'm funny because like, oh, there was bad. <laughs> there are a lot of stories like that. You know, people who are so terrified to do something, and then once they do it, they're like, "Let's do it again." <laughs> so I think that's one a lot of the big things with the taking a chance. Phobias is exposure therapy. You know, it yeah. works. Cognitive therapy, exposure therapy. So <laughs> when they say face your fears. That's it, baby. Just do it. Now, you might need professional help to do it. I'm not telling everybody to just go out and grab a snake or <laughs> whatever you're afraid of. Don't do that. But uh, face your fears in the name of art. What a better thing to, uh, you know, to yeah. uh, to sacrifice your, your security and even, like, part of your sanity to, <laughs> for your art. And then to realize, oh, hey, <laughs> you know. Yeah, maybe this isn't so bad. Maybe exactly. Because there's but... plenty of people that are forced Mm -hmm. out of their countries are forced to travel you know and you know don't want to if you have given this choice right. for something you'd love to do yeah <laughs> better do it boy I sound like a dad like you better finish your vegetables because <laughs> there's kids starving and wherever <laughs> it's horrible I don't know I don't think it's horrible <laughs> <laughs> so if somebody were to come to York mm -hmm. and spend I don't know a week here what are the top three places that you would recommend they go to eat because I know that this is your thing, among many okay. other things. Um, I think, number one, Victor's Italian Restaurant on Ogon Street has the most amazing Mediterranean food ever. And the chef, uh, George, has been there 10 years, which is unheard of sometimes in the restaurant industry. He really loves what he does. He has a great passion with it. So definitely Victor's Italian Restaurant. Um, the second place kind of unique would be Rob Burritos because uh, York had no burrito places until uh, Rob McGrath opened his and called it Rob Burritos and there's a story behind that he played in a band I believe the band was called Six South and he toured the country with that band and he made it a point to eat a burrito in every town he stopped that because he had this dream of opening a burrito restaurant he wanted to take the best of so he's, he accrued like two years of knowledge and he claims I don't remember an insane amount of burritos um, and then came back and opened a burrito shop and uh, he, there's a couple locations in New York now so I would say Rob Burritos would be number two number three Number three is a toughie. <laughs> um, I, this is a kind of a chain. Can I do that? Sure. I love DeCarlo's Pizza. Have you had DeCarlo's Pizza? No. So DeCarlo's Pizza is based out of Ohio, and it's just the most amazing pizza you'll ever have. So those, okay. would, those, those would be my top three. <laughs> All right. Any final thoughts? Um, no. I really want to thank you. I'm... 
I've never, I don't know that I've ever been interviewed this in depth. So I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to uh, bear my soul. And I hope it inspires somebody. Me too. Thank you. Because <laughs> this you, has Nancy. been really fun and, and very interesting and educational and entertaining. Awesome. Thank so, you, Nancy. Sure. See you again soon. That's our episode. Thanks so much for joining me and so many thank yous to Dominic Shortino. You can find show notes and learn more about how you can work with me to follow your curiosity at fycuriosity.com. I'd also love for you to join the conversation on Instagram. You'll find me at fycuriosity. Follow Your Curiosity is produced by me, Nancy Norbeck, with music by Joseph McDade. If you like Follow Your Curiosity, please subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget to tell your friends. It really helps me reach new listeners. See you next time.